Okay, very good morning. I hope you are well. It's Friday the 13th of September. Um, as you can see, the main man Mario to the side of me. Going to have a bit of a recap of the ECB from yesterday, particularly choppy price action, of course. We had that initial spike and sell-off in the first move, which was correctly anticipated by none other than Mr. Sam North yesterday. So a great call on how he saw that playing out. Um, again, really very much, if I just bring up the chart, a function of how the news comes out when you're trading a monetary policy event. Uh, I guess for anyone new to this, it was a really good example of why you shouldn't commit immediately to the first spike that you see in the marketplace. This is particularly prevalent when trading something as complex as a monetary policy announcement. It's very nuanced, it is very complicated, and it has many parts, which means then that what normally happens is the first headline that drops down, let's say, a Bloomberg terminal of which, say, algorithms are responding to, that's the first immediate move that gets hit. And in this case, if they cut only 10 basis points, when the market was more positioned for something potentially more. And then they do QE of 20 billion, the market was expecting 30. That's when you get an initial very quick spike. But then when it comes out and it's open-ended, there's a tiering system, there's more favorable terms around the targeted long-term refinancing operations and everything else that's more dovish, market then comes off. And so it really goes to show that you, know, you really shouldn't and this goes really more often than not for trying to trade uh, more complex economic data sets like non-farm payrolls when then they're not binary events they have you know multiple numbers and variables to monitor so i think a good example yesterday and i hope if there's anyone new to markets who watches our briefings that you know this was an example of you don't need to have that fomo there can be plenty of opportunity thereafter and if you actually look at the market as we went through the afternoon, he actually had a really quite impressive rally after all. You know, is what he's done enough, particularly on the tiering side, which we're going to discuss shortly, to help alleviate any of the tensions in the kind of interbank market that banks can lend and therefore offset this looming downturn uh, that seemingly feels almost inevitable in the Eurozone. And as such, then the Euro continues to recover at the moment. Uh, but we're going to go through and we'll have a look and review exactly what else happened. Elsewhere, the pound seeing uh, a little bit of upward move this morning. And I'm also going to go into some <coughs> excuse me, articles of interest, particularly in regard to the DUP. Report in the Times overnight uh, that was quite interesting, which I'll explain more. But you can see sterling already breaking above yesterday's high. Uh, above its R1, finding some technical resistance at the daily pivots at the R2 this morning. Uh, equity markets pretty quiet, although European bank stocks off to a pretty decent start on the back of the tiering announcement of the ECB yesterday. And fixed income futures pretty flat in the case of the US 10-year. However, the Bund trading down a decent amount this morning, underperforming in the wake of the ECB. Okay, so let's get into the news and as per usual I'll let Sam go over the charts in more detail so let's see what this chap unveiled in his penultimate meeting before he departs and hands over to Christine Lagarde at the end of October so here is the kind of summary of what happened so they cut the deposit rate rates obviously there's three major rates in Europe the one that people focus on the most deposit rate being that the one in negative territory so they cut that by 10 basis points but as Sam was informing you guys yesterday in the briefing there were some outside bets that they could have gone more aggressive 20 basis points I'm not sure if you saw that ING graphic <coughs> their kind of crib sheet infographic and they were going for 20 they weren't the only bank out there with those calls so we only got a 10 cut the other thing then I'm going to come back to the tiering and the forward guidance was here quantitative easing Net purchases will be restarted at a monthly pace of 20 billion as of November 1st. Purchases to continue until shortly before the first rate increase. Very important, that latter phrase. Basically, they're saying that it's open-ended. It's not until they start lifting rates, which is way off the cards now. Um, remember, we were only a few months ago talking about language that would specify from a seasonal point of view that rates would rise basically in the autumn 
We're now talking, we have seen execution of rate cut, and now the likelihood that QE is going to continue for some time. This is a look at uh, QE in its historic form from Europe. And as you can see, going all the way back to 2014, 15, 16, when it hit its peak, when the ECB were buying an excess of 80 billion net asset purchases per month. Finish at the beginning of the year, it's going to restart then in November. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is where we're at at the moment. So back to 20 billion, but remaining at that pace. Now, a couple of things uh, around this. If you take into account the recycling of the proceeds of existing bond holdings that mature, because you remember there are a number of bonds. Uh, bonds by nature hit their end date and their redemption and what the ECB effectively have been doing, like other central banks, like the Bank of England and so on, unlike the Fed who have at a period conducted quantitative tightening, others and ECB will continue to roll over those maturing bonds. So other than the 20 billion that they're buying, that does also mean that if you take into account the recycling of those proceeds of maturing bonds, they could end up purchasing about 35 billion euros uh, a month. So it's definitely a substantial quantitative easing program. Uh, and is this enough then, as they have aimed to do in previous years, to counteract the economic deterioration that's been happening at the moment? Um, QE, though, wasn't completely... I mean, there wasn't a, co a consensus here, as you can see countries which you would imagine the likes of Germany, Austria and the Netherlands all were against and opposed what Draghi wanted which was to go into this QE announcement to restart in November. Uh, Estonia and France were actually the other countries which also opposed but as you would imagine this kind of north-south divide, Italy, Spain, Greece of course, Ireland, the other country bailed out over the last couple of years, all um, backers of restarting the quantitative easing program. This does, though, have ramifications, I feel, for the fact that Draghi's not going to be there for much longer. And if you're Christine Lagarde, at the moment, you've got an absolutely divided Eurozone about what they feel is the best course of action to manage this economic environment at the moment. So she's definitely got a work cut out as soon as she comes in. But the stall has been set now from Draghi and we are expecting continuity and approach. Uh, it's whether or not she can appease then her, f her former country of finance minister. She used to be back in, what, 2007-09 in France and then the others as well, mainly being Germany. The other thing, of course, that the ECB announced was this, was tiering. Now, <coughs> me and Piers were actually talking about this. Uh, at 10 o'clock last night, <laughs> that's how, you know, how ridiculous it does get at times, but the tiering system is is incredibly complicated. I started reading some research reports last night and I thought, do you know what, I'm just going to go to bed because um, I need more time to figure this out. But from a top level, I can express it as far as traders are concerned because there's a big difference in markets and I try to express this to, to a lot of our interns, newer traders, that what economists write uh, and these are certainly the research reports that I'll read, it really doesn't hold much um, use for an intraday short-term speculative trader. It really is too complex. What the economists write are really to satisfy more hedge funds, for example, portfolio managers who are investing much more in the long term and really need to get under the bonnet to understand what are the ramifications for different sector out and under performance, what's the overall medium long term picture. From a trading point of view, it's very different um, in, in the short, more volatility environment. And from that, there's a couple of things that I can definitely go over. So to counteract the idea of negative rates, if you think about it, um, the banking sector, this has been very prevalent overall since we've hit this zero interest rate policy era. Banks have really struggled because their margins are getting squeezed. And particularly if we go into this negative rate environment, that's only going to hurt banks more. But if you think about the transmission of monetary policy into the system, it's not the central bank that goes straight into the consumer. The central bank must operate and lend and add liquidity to the interbank market, the big banks who then lend amongst each other 
which then artificially then lowers the lending rate for us, the consumer, as well as having a low interest rate environment direct from the central bank. So managing of this, 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 these intermediaries, these banks is critical. But the problem you have in the Eurozone at the moment is a lot of disruption in Italy. Banks there have been under incredible amount of stress as to in other countries like Spain. But then you've got, you've got banks like Deutsche Bank, which have been absolutely under pressure at the moment and are systemically important to the functioning of the financial system. So the central bank like the ECB know they cannot risk having any type of concerns around these big banks. So how can they counteract this but keep the, the negative rate in place? <coughs> so what they've did or what they've done is they've announced a tiering system to exclude some of the bank's excess deposits from negative rates. Now, in theory, some calculations <coughs> from some analysts say this would cut banks' costs of negative rates, i.e. the bank's amount that is being penalised by negative rates from €9 billion Euros a year to €6 billion. That's a substantial decrease to add then and kind of release more liquidity into the market, which should effectively help then lending conditions to offset then this looming economic recession if the inversion of the yield curve does inevitably prove to be correct. Now, while tiering will help Northern European banks because they have generally large excess deposits, cheap loans will also help Southern European lenders who obviously face higher funding costs given that they're generally seen as a lesser credit worthy um, place um, to park your cash. So all of this, I think that's probably the singular most important thing that actually came out yesterday. I think that's the first time that they've moved into this tiering system. They're not the first central bank to do this. I think Japan and this follows, I think the Swiss model. Um, this dates back a couple of years ago when obviously they dropped the floor on protection of 120 in Euro Swiss. They went negative in rates, but they also adopted this tiering, two-step tiering system. Um, so yeah, very important, uh, that development. The other thing, of course, that they did was down at the bottom. This is targeted long-term refinancing operations, or otherwise shortened to Teltros. Now, what they did here, as you can see on the right-hand side, they came out and confirmed plans to offer cheap loans for banks under their third Teltro, sweetening the terms by cutting the cost of borrowing and extending lengthening maturity to three years from two years. So another particularly dovish move. And again, this in combination with the QE open-endedness, with the tiering system, all offset then the initial spike on the more dovish disappointment on the 10 cut and the 20 billion so that's where you had that mixed move. Overall, though, these latter measures, as well as the ECB keeping a little bit left as ammunition by not going as big on the first two parts, means that actually, is this a positive thing? Does this mean then that this is a good measure to try to counteract this Eurozone downturn? Therefore, medium term, outside of that initial volatility, this is a Euro positive development. This is a, a European equity positive development and therefore net negative European fixed income. And that's what you're seeing in the market this morning as far as the asset classes are concerned. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a summary of why the market did what it did and, and, and the importance of the announcements that they made. All right, let's jump over to the US. I did see that all three major US indices closed in positive territory yesterday. <coughs> Not only at the ECB, stepping up in terms of their monetary toolbox being unleashed. You've also got more positive news on the trade side. And of course, this still remains the biggest threat to the global economy. But this was something which has kind of developed further from headlines from the day before. Trump administration officials have discussed offering a limited trade agreement to China that would delay. But most importantly, and for the first time the trade war has kicked off, they would even consider rolling back some U.S. tariffs, according to five people familiar with the matter in the Bloomberg article from late yesterday. Now, that latter point, I feel, is very important. If they start to roll back U.S. tariffs, I think that is a meaningful shift in a more positive direction for these trade talks. Interestingly, we've been seeing 
um, activity based economic data in the US like manufacturing PMIs started to weaken the consumer so far data has remained robust however if manufacturers and corporates start to suffer inevitably this starts to lead then to potential threats for unemployment to rise wages then to decrease which inevitably means the consumer becomes less confident and then that consumer data starts to weaken Trump knows this and that's a risk to the US economy going into an election year he can't allow that to happen so rolling back US tariffs is it inevitable at some point if he's to fulfill his mandate of securing a second term now one of the things then this follows of course what we had um, on late Wednesday Trump tweeted that it would be putting off 5% increase on tariffs on Chinese goods this comes ahead of working meetings between the teams of US and China which are going to take place next week so all positive signals and there was an article if I flip over to this one in Reuters privately run Chinese firms bought at least 10 boatloads of US soybeans on Thursday the country's most significant purchase since at least June Beijing this week renewed a promise to buy US agricultural goods such as pork and soybeans and of course that is the most valuable US farm export where agriculture is uh, absolutely pivotal to the performance of not only the US economy from a revenue stream but importantly and what will be key for the political popularity for Donald Trump where farmers are becoming increasingly frustrated by the fact that the trade wars are now having a meaningful impact on their ability to perform so all of this again quite positive this in combination with the ECB equities did finish positive and all things remain equal at the moment I'm feeling quite bullish again uh, but as we know headline risk is key just because they are you know looking positive at the moment we've seen this many times before and if there's one distinct pattern of behavior Donald Trump has had if they are going to have any type of meeting whether next week or potentially face to face in future Trump loves to then just remind them via Twitter who's the boss and he comes out and says something just the day before a meeting that's quite critical of China just to appease the kind of domestic electorate that he's being really aggressive going in and strong handed for the best interests of America so I do feel quite bullish for the moment though um, all I would say is there's always headline risk associated though uh, to these things so you need to be quite responsive to keeping an eye on Twitter for anything out of Trump okay final stories before I hand you to Sam now, if I just have a look at the pound this morning the pound is actually outperforming cables up 57 pips breaking a bit of a range here of the price activity of the recent days you can see here we've broken the high that was seen on the 9th breaking some of that range as well from um, the 10th we've already tested the R2 now a couple things I'd like to stress here one is this story came out overnight it's kind of came out at midnight the DUP opens door to new Brexit deal for Boris Johnson party agrees Northern Ireland could take some EU rules this is according to advisors close to Arlene Foster now that report has already been refuted the BBC have quoted her as saying the DUP denies the report it would accept Irish sea checks so that came out overnight one minute past midnight so a couple of important points here as the, as the way of news is released just given the fact of the job that I've always done I'm aware of these kind of mechanisms so the Times often have a, a, an important article that they released by an automated fashion at one minute past midnight if you were to look at the Sunday Times website at one minute past midnight you'll see that uh, all of the major articles initiate on their website live at one minute past midnight now that's fine it's not really important at the weekend but definitely if you're going to get a breaking piece of news to get some edge potentially on a move just be aware that that's the mechanism of how the news is released when it comes to the times of what I've seen over the years now importantly even though this was denied already earlier this morning that always doesn't matter remember if people start to circulate this article think about the way of which news is disseminated 
even though this has already been denied by Arlene Foster, it doesn't matter because if people start sharing this news without the rebuttal, the market's going to move and you're just being stubborn if you're not going to get involved if you're a speculative short-term trader looking to get hold of some momentum if you are a more activist type trader yeah, you've just got to go with what the market's doing stop using your brain trying to rationalize the situation that's when you've got to go with what's happening on the screen importantly though i think from a bigger context here for me personally politically there is no smoke without fire now think about this we are going into a general election all that's happened, in my opinion, is it's been delayed. We are going to a general election. The potential outcome of that general election is that Boris Johnson may well come out with a majority government. Now, there's obviously a lot of risk to this and so on. But let's stay with me. Let's talk this through. If he does get a majority, he doesn't need the DUP anymore. And Arlene Foster does not matter. This lady, who's been absolutely pivotal during the Brexit process, now, you don't matter anymore. So step aside. So what does that mean if I'm Arlene Foster? Well, if I'm Arlene Foster, I know this, I'm going to start talking to Boris Johnson. And I'm going to start saying to Boris Johnson, potentially we could accept a couple of European rules, actually, if it helps you get the deal over the line. As long as we can be involved in your government and have some say and ultimately receive funding and still be aligned to appease that we're part of Britain. So, again, as I say, I don't think you get smoke without fire. And I think that this is true, even though she's come out and denied it this morning and refuted the report. This is the way that journalism works uh, to that. So, that's just my view. I think the pound is absolutely valid to rally even though she's denied it this morning and the move though in my opinion is done at this point i think if you if you've missed it i'd be a little reluctant to get too aggressive to want to get in again at this point perhaps if we come for a little bit of a further pullback uh, could be interesting i'd be more concerned then or how other asset classes and general market sentiment for the day is shaping up in, in that regard <clears throat> okay quick look at the calendar I feel like I've been ranting a little bit at the, <laughs> with this briefing. So let me just wrap things up. If I just make this a bit bigger, let's see what's on the agenda for today. Um, you've got very light morning um, going into the U.S. session, import, export prices. U.S. retail sales, of course, will be interesting. We are looking for a slight decrease at 0.3 from 0.7 in the month-to-month -month retail sales. Uh, remember again, retail sales, as I was kind of suggesting with monetary policy events, retail sales is quite a tricky one. Um, if you actually look at retail sales, it's month on month, year on year, ex auto, month on month, ex auto gas, and you get the retail control group. Now, not only that, you get revisions to all previous of those numbers. So even with retail sales report on its own, excluding the fact that we also have business inventories. Uh, well, that's later, excuse me, including the fact we have import-export prices coming out at the same time. Retail sales alone is one, two, three, four, five times two, ten pieces of data coming out. So again, it's not about trying to commit and take a gamble and risk inappropriately to try and trade this data. It's about understanding it and then looking to take action if it should show its hand, i.e. if it's an outlying number and if it's all pointing in the same direction, could then often offer the best opportunity so 130 some data and then you've got the preliminary university of michigan not expecting a great deal out of that to be honest i still think the consumer relatively holding on to some degree of positivity at the moment then any oil traders baker hughes rig count later and then for any sterling traders bank of england's cunliffe is speaking at a eurogroup forum later this morning at 10 15. okay that's it from me I'm going to wish you a fantastic weekend ahead, and I'll see you on Monday. Thanks very much, guys. Yeah, hey, hi guys. Uh, good morning. Uh, happy Friday the thirteenth. Hopefully, not too uh, a spooky of a, a day. We'll have a, a look over the pound as, as you can see, breaking uh, higher, um, and uh, yeah, now one. 24.57 of course the the futures roll over now trading uh, the December uh, contract uh, as well so now we're back above the that level that was the ninth of course what was
quite a, a good level 124 technically on the old contract now we we're, we're, are above that but yeah this headline putting us uh, us through here and just having a, a quick look on the on that daily you can just see how important it's going to be literally where we're trading now uh, was the the low that we had back on the uh, 17th of July of this contract so where we close the week the effectively the day as well uh, will be massive for for this market and uh, at the moment it seems that that conversation me and Ant had about the uh, uh, chance of a lifetime to get long pound could well be right now uh, looking uh, like a massive mistake 400 ticks above that low and you can see what happened just psychologically when we uh, failed to close below 120 and we're now uh, all the way up here and what a difference a, a few weeks uh, has made there uh, the pound obviously this is this is that key level to, to keep an eye on and focus on for the remainder of the week having a look euro euro's loving it as well of course so what's good for the pound because of brexit uh, it's going to be good for the euro to an extent as well um, and euro pound while i want to bring in euro pound before we go back to that euro because that's got a very important area as well can we for the pound here get below what has been such a good area of support going back to, to June as well. Had another test in July and then a couple of uh, days ago, uh, you know, to, to focus on that area uh, for the end of the week would be massive, massive if we can get a close below uh, there for the Euro pound. Euro, as mentioned, pushing higher as well and we're coming up to levels not seen since uh, the 29th. Uh, of August so quite a, a key point to, to keep an eye on there and you know speaking to a couple of friends yes, uh, yesterday and I've told you guys I had a, a friend who was who has been long silver for, for quite some time and uh, it was going well and it was a winning trade for him and uh, they were looking to, to get back in uh, and the idea of you know yesterday with, with some dollar weakness and with the ECB cutting rates and uh, Donald Trump within a matter of moments on the Twitter uh, saying that the Fed should be doing so as well you know are we going to get now some dollar weakness into uh, the Fed meeting next Wednesday and of course silver and gold may like the, the look of that uh, the dollar already down 0.2 today so a bit of a dollar weakness across the board key level for euro just being tested uh, and then of course you'll be looking at any of those other uh, previous highs as areas of support in terms of, of looking for a reversal for, for the euro uh, understandably we're finding some resistance there I think it's you know probably we haven't quite got it yet but what has really helped the uh, the euro in, in recent times when you do get push higher to then get short again is when you can get a build up of a trend line uh, from from the lows as well and uh, yeah you, you know if we close below say the previous uh, high of yesterday then we can drift lower of course but certainly for a more medium term trade I'd like to see a trend line kind of build up uh, much like the last few weeks and months and, and that for, to break and, and that give the cue to, to get short again uh, but we will see of course with the Fed coming next week it'll be interesting to see what stocks do and uh, we're you know, a similar day from yesterday away from uh, all time highs <laughs> again in, in US equities and um, there we go, just draw that, that line on there at the 45, 29, 45. You can see what happens just technically. Just technically you break above, then the good stories make more impact to the upside. Uh, people that were short don't want to be short anymore. And uh, the next resistance we found, um, you can see from uh, the breakdown uh, before the last day of July. And then yesterday, the lower point of the, the day, 3,000 psychological handle on the future. So technically working very well. Uh, there and, and you can see I think the, the all time high is about well, just under 29, 30.29 so uh, it uh, wouldn't be too surprising to see us to get that today uh, however we have hit the, the high from yesterday already uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 times on the hourly so strong resistance there keep an eye on that because uh, a break above there when there's real volume uh, it could be a formality uh, up to the all-time high. Worth keeping an eye, however, on the you know the trend that's just starting to form from the the lows. Uh, we're keeping obviously a watch on the DAX, what that that does uh, as well this morning. But I think overall we've got to be favouring uh, places to look to get long 
for US uh, equities. 3,000 has worked though, so to the downside, uh, there's some other key points just below the previous highs that we had back on the 9th uh, and the 11th at 2992, which I'd also like to see hold as support. Uh, and only really then if we were to get below there, yes, back into no man's land, but uh, as a key area of support are broken, then I guess we could start looking for that real test of 29.44 again, which hasn't actually uh, come as of yet. So stocks are higher, dollar is weak. Today, uh, Donald Trump will be happier. And of course, oil, a uh, couple of days uh, has finished lower. Uh, coming up to a key point, I'm just going to put this back onto a 15 minute chart just to show you how key this area of resistance could be for, for oil price. And we're just coming to the lower point of that zone, 55.26 to 38, and it will take a, a couple of cent either way. You can see we struggled one, two, three, four, and now five times to really get back above that area. So definitely one to keep an eye on for, for oil traders. And to the downside, the uh, the lows of today have been, again, tested quite a lot as well. So perhaps a mini range coming in uh, and as good as ever uh, for a line in the sand for, for oil price there. Uh, as well, if we were to break out the top part of this range, obviously just keeping an eye on the low that we had from Wednesday, which ignited uh, another leg lower uh, around 10.30 yesterday when that had broken. Quick look over at uh, gold as we did have a push this morning on that dollar weakness. We come back to to test there of what's been really key technical level, uh, 1508.7 you can see from yesterday, uh, yeah, afternoon and this morning and again just now. So just keep an eye uh, on this, how uh, well the bulls defend this level back below there, while you would still have uh, an area of support on these previous highs. I would just, uh, just be favoring, I, I would say if we can get below 1507.8, so around where I'm just going to draw this circle, that's when I would then be confident we can then drift lower. Uh, but at the moment, the bulls are in control. And the higher the day, you can see uh, not too far away from where we are trading. Quick look over at what the DAX is doing, as it's going to be important whether uh, US equities as well can get a break of that five times tested high from the last 24 hours. It's found resistance on its high, just coming down uh, the pivot, a key area of support. So a bit of a, a small range. Uh, not too unlike the, the DAX to, to be contained on a, a Friday morning. Uh, any questions as usual, please uh, do let us know. Obviously, with it being Friday the 13th, I we'll hope you're all very safe out there. Um, but any questions, please uh, do feel free to, to contact us throughout the day. A couple key levels to, to keep an eye on as we go into the close of the week. Just be aware of that contract rollover uh, on the, the futures. Uh, and uh, when we speak to you, you all Monday, it could well be that stocks are at new all-time highs.